making all of the recordings available okay. to people okay. on the club's YouTube channel. Um, okay. Some, some of the, you know, there's been a range in, you know, you know, d different speakers and talking about different things or whatever, but uh, they're interesting. If you have absolutely nothing to do, I definitely recommend them. So okay. tonight, I we're going to live up to, uh, to that standard. Um, so I, um, I will share my screen. Um, and um, I, oh, no, you have to let me share my screen. Oh, okay. And before I do, I just want to, you know, just uh, introduce folks to Shabazz, even though I assume everybody is here because they read what um, I put out, which is that um, Shabazz is active as a bike advocate here in New York um, for years. And um, one of the things that I really like, I find very distinctive about Shabazz and what he has to say, I, you know, I hear it in like advisory groups or boards or what have you, but just on Twitter, uh, Shabazz just has this eagle eye. He knows how to pick out exactly what is kind of interesting or like what's wrong with this picture sort of thing and uh, is good at posting them. They come through and it really is like a great and unique perspective on what's been going on in our city during this pandemic. Um, I've, I've tried to bring as many voices as I can, uh, distinctive voices to this space about um, what's going on with the city's transportation policy, what's going on with cycling during the pandemic, what's going wrong, the opportunities, some of which sometimes are being exploited with, you know, more or less well. Um, and, uh, you know, Shabazz is a really important addition to that. And um, he's going to talk a little bit um, from his perspective, which I think is where he gets that eagle eye, working for the Business Improvement District in downtown Brooklyn, which is a very important um, organization that helps sort of manage streets. And I think it's where um, it's an, it's an important and interesting perspective on the city, as well as as the founder and chief executive officer of Unipod, which I hope he'll tell us about. I know he's very modest about his business ventures, but he's more interested in talking policy with us and bicycling. But um, Unipod is um, a, a really great answer to the bike security issues that a lot of us have, um, not without reason. We've all lost one or more bikes over the years. So um, it's a traumatic experience that you never really let go of. Um, but Shabazz has actually, you know, come up with some solutions to try to deal with that in the urban context. So I'm just going to let him um, start sharing the screen. And um, Oh, why isn't it? You have to make me be the host. So you don't have share screen abilities, you think? No, it says the host has disabled screen share. Okay. Um, so just make, you can right click on my name and you can make me up. Oh, I go. think that's what I did. I think I just upgraded you. Sorry for the delay. Um, okay, great. Can you see my screen? Can you see you smiling? With yes. Um, okay. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, my name is, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, Shabazz Stewart. Um, let me just try to find it. Um, this is, uh, kind of, okay, well, I'll figure that out later. Uh, I'm Shabazz Stewart. Um, I want to say a few things before I, I, I really get going in the presentation. Um, foremost, you know, I would encourage everyone um, to share their questions um, that uh, we can we can address later uh, in the Q and A period um, in the chat section as I'm going through the presentation. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, my background and um, about what I want to talk about with you all tonight. Um, I was born and raised 
here in Brooklyn, um, and I never learned to drive. In fact, I always relied on public transportation as my primary means um, of getting around the city. Um, I learned to bike really in a city in Boston in college, um, and I came back and brought that um, to New York. I, um, you know, was a policy major um, in college and really went to postgrad um, here in New York and, and also focused in policy. And as Steve mentioned, I went to work early in my career um, for business improvement district, eventually becoming the deputy director of operations. Um, now, as I became more advanced in my knowledge of, of getting around town by a bike, um, you know, I kept on having a bike stolen. In fact, I had three stolen in a period of five years. And it occurred to me um, while I was at the bid, if, if this is really ever going to be a cogent um, mode of transportation and not just something that's a novelty, you really have to think through all the, all the elements and pieces of the ecosystem that need to be in place um, for people really to adopt this. And so the way I approached this, this work um, is not just um, as an advocate or an activist, but as someone um, who comes from mainly a policy perspective um, and wants to apply that, those best practices um, to the world of, of, of biking, particularly in New York. Um, you know, Steve mentioned Uni, and I know Uni is here uh, displayed prominently, and that's, spoiler alert, that's because I used Uni letterhead <laughs> for the presentation, because um, I don't have my own, but um, you know, Uni is, is, is a product of that. It's something that um, you know, I don't really look at as a business venture. I look at it as my way to, um, to be impactful in the landscape. Um, simply put, I think as advocates, you know, it would behoove us to find ways to just go do stuff and to show government um, how it's done. So you know, after, um, after kind of going to the DOT and going to um, you know, City Bike and saying, hey, look, this is our cool idea. We had some renderings, we had you know, conceptually how it would work and getting uh, the door kind of politely closed in our face a number of times and said, you know what, we're just gonna go do it ourselves. I would like to think that in another lifetime, um, I'd be working for government in doing this. You know, I see as a, as, a, as a kid who grew up riding transit and as someone who still loves transit, um, I see what I'm doing is just building infrastructure. Um, and, and building transportation systems that people can actually use. The only difference is, um, and this is largely a function of where we are in our society today, um, this has to be enshrined in a, in a small business capitalist paradigm and can't, you know, isn't really, um, can't really find a home um, in government, right? Can't find a home in an innovation department in the city or within a DOT. It has to be something that is um, a startup. But, um, you know, as I'll address later in the presentation, this really is a byproduct of a desire to build a transportation system that works for the city. So um, with that being said, I will um, get started here. Um, look, I think when we, when, we, when we try to understand where we are um, with New York and, and, and bicycles, um, there's some really interesting top line trends. Um, you know, on the left, we have this 700% increase since the year 2000 that I think is really profound. And um, that sounds like a lot and it's because it is a lot. So, you know, in March, we were actually at 350%, but then it doubled again, right, during COVID. And so now when you look at the number of bikes that are on the street today, compare that with the year 2000, you're, you're talking about 700% more. Uh, and that's something that, you know, I think if you were told Paul City White, you know, in the year 2005, when we started working at Transall, that this is where we we're going to be, I think um, we'd all be, you know, I think, I think hats would fall off. Um, I think we're seeing um, a shift in, in, in how people are riding. We're seeing e-bikes um, start to become a, an increasingly larger share of the market. Um, e-bike sales are up 190% since 2019. So that's just um, in the course of a year. Um, and we're also seeing um, the city spend a lot more in the way of resources um, with bi on bicycle lanes. So in, in uh, 2007, we had about 119 bicycle lanes. Now we have 1,250. There's obviously a long way to go. And these bicycle lanes, as you'll hear my, um, my thoughts that are on, are um, rather imperfect. But it's still a monumental shift from where we were um, 
20 years ago. Um, and I think it lays the foundation for where we can be. Um, now, when we start to think about the problems that we have as, um, as, as, as a cycling ecosystem, um, it's, it's really would behoove us to compare it to other forms of transit. So um, with cars, I don't have a driver's license, but I do, I do find myself often a passenger. With cars, we have this really robust, quite intentional ecosystem that has been built out um, to allow people to drive around cities. So we have affordable lease, leasing and rental options. We have um, highly distributed uh, sales channels for um, both sales and service. I think about car dealerships, I think about, I think one out of every three commercials on TV is a car commercial. You have um, license plates and registration that are, that are state sponsored with the DMV. Um, you have a, a pre-owned vehicle market. You have insurance uh, companies that provide, um, you know, that guard against da damage and loss. You have parking everywhere. So New York City has about 3.5 to 4 million uh, free parking spaces on street. You have parking minimums um, in buildings. When you build a new building in New York, by default, you are required to basically provide, you know, 0.3 to 0.5 parking spaces per new unit of housing. Um, we have an extensive and convenient uh, refueling network. So gas stations even today are dot the city. So if you're, you're, you're driving your car, um, you're usually only um, a mile away from the nearest gas station. And, and most importantly, I think we've got um, safe, dedicated streets for cars. So streets have been optimized largely to, um, to be conducive to driving fast safely. If you've been to the West Side Highway or Lexington Avenue or Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, you see um, you know, three-ton vehicles, five-ton vehicles, 10-ton vehicles going pretty fast and, and doing so rather safely. So great for the cars, those streets are, but not so great for everyone else. Um, the result is even in New York City, 27% um, of, of citizens commute via automobile. So we are at about one third mode share um, in New York City, which is pretty impressive given that um, most people in New York City don't actually own a car, about 50% don't own a car. Um, and that's because again, this kind of robust ecosystem that makes it really conducive um, to getting around by, um, by a vehicle. But even looking at transit, we've got a very similar kind of ecosystem present. So in New York City, you have 472 subway stations. That's not including the path. You've got 270 commuter rail stations. Subways you know, have relatively frequent service. You've got um, a, a, a nomenclature and presence that is um, relatively ubiquitous. You, know, you go to um, you know, a local uh, bodega, you go to uh, you know, a, um, a service center for you know, New York City Information Center, you know, KTS booth is usually very easy to get a subway map. Everyone seems to know how to get around in the subway. And the subway system, by and by, you know, complaints notwithstanding, seems to be relatively easy to navigate. Um, there are help points and even apps that are created just to help people understand how they get around and um, how, to, you know, how to pay, et cetera. So if you go on Google Maps, for example, there is, there is, a, there is a, um, you can get the live results of, of when your train is about to come, when it's approaching, et cetera. And that just goes to show you that um, this is something that's relatively hegemonic in our experience as, um, as, a, as a New Yorker, as New Yorkers, excuse me. Um, and also equally as important, equally as importantly, like the, the, the system that we have in place today, especially on the commuter rail side, is, is quite integrated with the motor vehicle or economy. So we've got these parking garages that you can drive up to, park your car or vehicle, um, and you can get on a, a commuter rail um, train, uh, LIRR, NJ Transit, or Metro North, and you can, um, you can continue your journey. Um, and the result is we have six million plus um, riders a day in the metropolitan area. It's the highest in North America. And it's no coincidence that we have this relatively robust um, tr transit, um, transit, transit um, network in New York City that facilitates all of that. Um, so for cyclists, this experience is fractured um, and it's unreliable and inconvenient. And that's a theme I'm gonna return to again and again and again, because I think too often we think only in, in the context of safety we don't really think about something as reliable and convenient. No one drives their car, for example, and says, oh, great, it was really safe today. They say the traffic was terrible 
it was inconvenient. No one rides a subway and says, wonderful, I got to uh, my destination really safely in one piece. They say it was slow, it was, the train was late, it was smelly, um, it was loud. And so we have to apply that same manner of thinking, that same paradigm, when we think about people using bikes. And so there's, there's a bevy of kind of um, elements that are really inconducive to people really using bikes as a primary mode of, of navigating the city. So we've got no interconnecting network um, with transit options. I'll get to this in a second, but um, you know, right now it's really hard to use a bike or a scooter um, and to actually plug it into the transit system. Um, we've got a really incomplete network of cycling lanes. Um, and the ones that we have that exist only offer um, really cosmetic or aesthetic protection from vehicles. Um, it's very frightening for people who are new to riding a bike for the first time. Um, we have no convenient options for bike parking. Very few buildings offer convenient storage options. Um, and there's really no way to navigate the Byzantine system that we have so you can identify the ones that exist in terms of parking and storage. In terms of how you actually get your bike fixed and repaired, um, this, the, that, that landscape is relatively Byzantine as well. Um, and I'll get into each of these um, in a second. So when we think about mobility and safety, um, you know, look, there, let's talk about transit connectivity first. Um, New York City um, is actually, you know, far behind its peers in how we integrate cycling uh, with transit. And considering that New York City has by far the highest mode share of transit in North America, it's really a disservice um, to, to people who bike and people who um, would like to use bikes to get around. So for example, we are the only big city in the country um, where there are no bike racks on the buses. You can go to Los Angeles, San Francisco, Washington DC, Boston, you will always find bike racks and buses. Here in New York City, the MTA is just starting to experiment with bike racks and buses in Staten Island. <laughs> it's, it's a clear, um, it's, 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 a cl it's a clear placating move, um, something that the transit agency isn't really interested in. Um, but think about the implications of that. Let's say you're biking on the street and it starts pouring rain uh, and you decide that you want to take a bus to finish your journey. Well, you can't do that in New York. In New York, you're out of luck, right? Um, you are going to have to haul your bike on the subway. We don't really have um, escalators and elevators everywhere, or you're going to have to bike in the rain. Um, you can see here in this photo, um, we don't really have a network of bicycle routes. Um, we've got some bicycle lanes, um, but the bicycle lanes we have are largely suboptimal. Here in this photo, which I actually shot this weekend, um, you have um, a green lane. So this is one of New York's um, quote unquote more protected lanes because it's, it's actually um, right up against the curb. There's no, there's no parked cars. But uh, without Shabazz, actual- Shabazz, Shabazz, we're not seeing yep. your photo. I just want you can't to see my, you can't see my photo in the, in the presentation here. Oh, the black and white photo. That's yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the side. The so, was, so I'll use my mouse to, to point. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got a green lane here um, and um, a car can just park right in. All right. And you've got the cyclists here on the side. We're going to have to navigate into traffic around the vehicle. Um, that's part of the course for most of New York's protected lanes. Um, and the routes that exist, the ones that are protected are often dangerous um, and inconvenient. I'm gonna talk about what that means to be inconvenient for a second. When you think about um, New York's top tier premium streets for retail, Fifth Avenue, um, Broadway, Fulton Street in Brooklyn, Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, very few of them are actually cycling destinations. So New York has this tendency um, to place cycling facilities, cycling routes, especially in, in the so-called outer boroughs uh, on, on secondary or even tertiary streets. So living in Crown Heights, you know, where Fulton Street um, is the main sort of like um, shopping destination, um, the cycling routes are going to be, are located on Dean, Bergen, uh, on Willoughby and Decal. Um, and that's, that's, that's I suppose, um, good from a, from a DOT perspective because you don't have to really get rid of the parked cars or get rid of traffic. But you know, many of the cyclists would rather be closer to the destinations, which almost always are on uh, the primary corridors. And so you see people actually biking down Nostrand, biking down Fulton, biking down Flatbush um, with very, very limited protection. 
Um, I will say that Broadway is a really prime example of what can happen when a city looks at a main corridor um, and decides to um, allocate a lot of that street space for walking and for biking. You can see that even though there are a lot of primary destinations on Broadway, um, people can bike down it and it's actually something that people often choose to do. That's, that's the exception that proves the rule in New York. Um, cycling connectivity just isn't considered a top priority here in New York City. And as a result, we don't see cycling crack that top tier of transit. So a classic example of what I mean by that is when you ride the subway, you see that subway map, do you see uh, city bike stations um, labeled at subway stops? Do you see cycling corridors or key cycling facilities labeled at subway, at subway stops? No, that's actually the exception. You look at other great cycling cities like uh, London and Paris and Amsterdam, that's an exception. If we want to get to um, a cycling uh, sort of mecca where people are relying on, on bikes to get around, that's something that we have to really address. Um, we don't really have a parking or storage um, system um, that is comprehensive at all. So something that people don't really realize, um, bicycle theft is only one of the many um, suboptimal byproducts that exists from the lack of parking, but it's perhaps the most pervasive and the most traumatic. Over half of ur all urban cyclists um, experience bike theft, and that comes from a study um, that was done in Montreal. When you, when you, when you realize and you apply that um, to, to New York, it means about 75,000 stolen bikes annually. Um, so 7% of people who experience bike theft don't replace their bikes. You can imagine what that really means. It means you're taking maybe three steps forward and one step backwards every year. You know, people, um, you know, they buy a new bike, they, you know, love their bike, they um, are kind of afraid of getting their bike stolen and they get, they get their bike stolen and it's this demoralizing, awful experience. And for a lot of New Yorkers, um, they may not return to a bike, a bike again if for a few years. And so as a result, um, people are largely opting um, to, to um, gravitate towards other modes of transit. Um, as we start to see, I know this is the bike club, but you know it's important to acknowledge other micromobility form factors. As we start to see you know, one wheels, scooters, um, you know, uh, trikes become more prevalent, um, the, the issue of clutter on the streetscape and the issue of um, actually how we organize street spaces is getting even more prevalent. In other cities, there's pictures from LA where you've got dockless scooters we have a lot of the same problem. We don't have any on-street space that's allocated towards parking and organizing bikes and scooters. And so when you walk down a lot of major streets in New York, um, you see these skeletons, like on the right, on the left here, you see these bike carcasses, right? Where each one of those represents usually someone who's had their dreams crushed and um, has most likely exited the mode for a period of time. Um, now, when it comes to thinking about um, a key part of the experience, you have to think about what happens when your bike needs service or repair. Um, you know, most new adopters um, to the world of cycling um, are not road warriors who know how to fix their bike, right? I speak to you as someone who wouldn't trust, I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't trust myself to fix my chair, let alone <laughs> my bike. Um, so I, you know, when my bike behaves badly, the first place I go is my local bike shop. And, you know, we've had a trend in New York for many years where bike shops have been closing. And that's a largely a result of, um, of, of, of the retail crisis where rents have been going up and up. But um, it's also the result of, um, you know, I think just the city of New York, and I'll get this in a little bit later in the presentation, just not finding a way to support bike shops, not realizing that secure, bike shops are a really key part of the experience. And so today, when we've seen this doubling in the number of bikes in the street, um, we have these long lines before the bike shop. This is Vanderbilt Avenue Bike Habitat, um, and this is part of the course. And so think about what happens if you are a rider and you know, you're in a herd, you gotta wait in a long line just to get your bike um, even seen. So think about the implications for people who've been in crashes or people who um, you know, need to get their bike working for tomorrow, what they're going to do. I will say that as people gravitate more towards e-bikes um, and e-scooters, the support ecosystem is even less. So um, people, um, many bike shops refuse to service e-bikes and e-scooters. They fix gears, they don't fix motors. Uh, and so people are finding, adopters are finding that 
there is no um, cogent ecosystem that exists. They're on their own. They've got to, you know, haul their heavy e-bike to a service center, maybe one of a handful that exists in the city. Um, and that might take days or weeks. That has really profound implications for how people choose to rely on their bikes. And I'm going to, you know, hammer this home again and again and again. We have to get to a place where using a bike or scooter um, is convenient and reliable, ideally more so than using a car. Um, I will close in this slide by saying that our network of bike shops was built for a bygone era where bikes were mostly recreational. So this idea that you're gonna walk into a bike shop and they're gonna maybe tune up your bike in a few days um, is really built on the notion that um, your bike is an amenity. It's something that um, you, you, you can use if you'd like to, but not something you really need. You know, you need your bike for tomorrow's race, you don't need your bike to get to work. But I'm gonna talk about that idea for a second, an amenity versus utility and the implications that it has for how as uh, policymakers we think about bikes. Um, I found it to be rather pervasive in the world of policy in New York City that people, when they think of a cyclist, they think of, you know, usually a, an affluent um, person who's white who um, rides their bike to work because they want to get some exercise or maybe they want to see the city or maybe um, it's just the novelty of it all, right? And they're usually riding either an expensive or more expensive uh, personally owned bike or they're riding on bike share. But um, there's a whole group of people here in New York um, who actually ride not because um, they want to or not because it's something that is going to get them exercise, but because they have to. And those people are largely left out of the conversation, even though they account for what is likely a majority of, 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 of mode share. Um, so here in this picture, you have um, a delivery cyclist. There are 50,000 working cyclists in New York City, a large percentage of whom um, work for restaurants delivering food. Um, the DOT cycling in the city report doesn't even include pictures of them because the city for many years confiscated their e-bikes. Um, you know, we've got an increasing number of mostly minority young men who are delivering for services like Grubhub and Seamless um, and DoorDash and Postmates. Um, and those are people who, again, are working because um, cycling um, is a means for economic success, a means for a job. They're essential workers, quote unquote, not because it's something that is an elective. Um, and, you know, you've got folks who are just um, in communities of color, period, who use um, bikes as a means to get around. So um, the League of American Cyclists found that um, poor Americans in general were more likely to bike for transportation and immigrants uh, were the most likely to bike uh, for transportation. I think understanding that we are not just designing um, a, um, you know, a, a system for people who um, can choose to bike but may have other options. Um, instead, we're designing a system for people who need to bike is very, very critical. We want to have um, a system of infrastructure that's in place that allows you to get around because you absolutely need to use your bike to get from point A to point B. And you think about that for a second and think about cars. If, if, if you had a highway and the city said, sorry, we're closing the highway down today, it'll be open you know, a few weeks from now, um, there would be an uproar, right? Uh, we, well, we, so we're, just, we're just repaving like it. The we're just, bike, like the Hudson River bike path, just correct, within right? last month where the city announced they were shutting it down for Cherry Walk and then they didn't do it. And then they shut down a different part for which there was no notice. And, 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 and the city, you know, that's a great point. And because the city, again, the, the, I was thinking about milling roads, but that's a, that's a, a very astute point. The city, the city shuts down bike lanes without notice. Um, roads are milled without notice, making them largely impassable. So um, imagine if that were done for transit. If the city said, hey, how are you? Today, um, the 8th Avenue line is just closed. And it, it'll open up when you feel like it. Can you imagine? That would be unacceptable. It's unimaginable. But that's the system we have for cyclists. And it's largely because we're viewing cycling as this amenity where if bike lanes are closed, if bike shops are closed, then the, then the idea is that there, there are other ways that people can get around and they're going to choose those other ways because they don't really need to bike in the first place. And if we continue to have that, that mode of thinking, um, we're never going to get to 25 or 30% mode share. Um, so these burning questions are the ones that often pose to policymakers, right? Just to hammer home this point of, of let's think of cycling as something 
where we need to plan for the entire experience, not just for safety or, or not just for, um, you know, getting to a few places. So what do you do if you buy a 1000 bicycle dollar bicycle and you have no place to park it? Where does that live? Are you going to ride your bicycle that costs a thousand dollars and leave it on the street? You're probably not. Now let's imagine it's a $2,000 e-bike or a $3,000 e-bike. You know, you're going to say, you know, I have my nice new bike, but I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel safe riding it around the city because it's going to get stolen from me. That's a very, very common complaint that we hear. Um, what happened? Who do you call? I, present company notwithstanding, uh, Steve, but who do you call if you've been in a bike crash, right? If, you, if you're in a car crash, you call AAA. They come and they take care of you. They're the pros. If you're in a bike crash, what do you do? Who do you call, right? What's the protocol? Now, I imagine for a cyclist who's been, um, who's been hardened by the streets of New York, that might seem like an odd question, but for a new cyclist, um, who is used to a, perhaps a more concierge-like experience, what do you do? Who do you call? Is there a bicycle equivalent of AAA? What do you do? Um, if you get a flat tire at the Manhattan Bridge at 3 a.m., what do you do? Do you bike, you know, do you drag your bicycle home? Uh, you know, do you call a cab and hope that they can fit your bicycle inside? Now, today, remember, the subway shut down at 1. So what are you really going to do now? You know, the, the buses don't have bicycle racks. So you're on your own. And um, who do you call when your e-bike breaks down? You need to fix by tomorrow. That might seem like an odd scenario, but it's a scenario that lots of Brooklyn cyclists face every day. If your primary means of livelihood is using your e-bike to make food deliveries and you need your e-bike fix, who do you call? What do you do? Um, what happens if you need to bring a bike on the bus um, and you can't? What do you do with that bike? Where, where does it go? And lastly, can you afford to use a bike in New York? If you go to a bike shop and you say, look, um, the cost of fixing this bike that you need is $125 um, and you make minimum wage or below as do a significant percentage of New Yorkers, what are you gonna do? Um, is, is cycling not for you? Now, mind you, when we think about this, um, this, this last question here, um, you might say, look, I think riding a bike in New York is actually pretty cheap. And you'd be right, but when you think about public transit, um, the unlimited metro card is basically a payment plan for, uh, for using the subway. We've created ways to bring down the cost of riding public transit that we just simply haven't applied um, to cycling as an ecosystem. And so as a result, you know, for many people who live paycheck to paycheck, which again, we're talking about roughly a third of New York City, um, cycling and riding a bike that actually works uh, remains a pretty daunting task. Um, so I'm going to talk for a bit about um, two cities, LA and London, and, and some interesting lessons that we can learn. You know, I think as New Yorkers, we kind of regard LA as a public transit desert um, and like a largely primitive society that's in the medieval age. But it may surprise folks to learn that LA, like most cities on the West Coast, is light years ahead of New York in thinking through um, cycling infrastructure and the cycling experience as a whole. So um, LA Metro, um, which is that city's subway system, that, and, they, and they're paired with their city's DOT, um, has about 10 of these what we call bike hubs. And those bike hubs are um, near some of their major transportation destinations, Union Station, um, Hollywood and Vine, et cetera. And they um, are basically marquee facilities that are being constructed um, at the, at, you know, on the dollar of, of, of public transit, and they provide bike parking, but they also provide bike service, bike maintenance, bike rentals, and um, bike sales. Uh, and that, again, that, that might seem, um, in the context of New York, to be unbelievable, but yeah, in transit facilities, at key stations, they've got these massive um, sort of stores where you can park your bike for free uh, with a tap card, which is their metro card, you can buy a bike, rent a bike, you can get your bike tuned up and repaired. Um, and they're expanding the program. It's considered kind of a no-brainer for them. San Francisco also has a, a, a more nascent bike uh, hub program. And other cities like DC and Chicago um, have a few facilities as well. New York has none of these facilities. They don't exist. <laughs> um, but bike lockers um, are plentiful throughout the LA Metro network. So at most LA Metro subway stations, um, they are uh, at least bike lockers where you can go leave your bike um, and, and ride the subway um, for a fee. We actually spent with Uni some time working with LA Metro 
And they, you know, we're thinking about working with them in a partnership. Um, they kind of told us that it's standard. All their new transit facilities, they're building two new subway lines, um, are going to have bike parking built into the stations. And they kind of were like, well, duh, how are people going to park their bikes? <laughs> in that context, you know, New York is ages behind. Um, in London, and I apologize for low-resolution photos, um, in London, um, they've tackled um, what we call dispersed bike parking um, with bike hangers. So you can see here on the left, you've got uh, a network of these cycle hangers that are um, on residential streets. And that's largely born out of the realization that um, London has pretty old housing stock and people can't lug their bikes up to the top floor. So you may have bike storage available in your apartment, but it may not be convenient. It may not be easy to use. So you can, in London, uh, you can, um, in some boroughs, access um, relatively cheap. It's like um, three pounds, four pounds a month on street bike parking. Now, here's the thing. London has about 6,000 of these and announced another 8,000. So we're actually talking about a, a pretty robust on street, basically protected bike corral network, um, you know, that allows people to kind of, for a small price, come in and use um, these structures and, and protect their bikes. There's some drawbacks, you know, these aren't smart, so they're only operate through lock and key. Uh, they, you know, that means that if someone perhaps goes away for a holiday um, and they take their bike with them, this is underused space, but it's still light years ahead of what we have in New York. Um, London has a uh, comprehensive plan for routes. So they call it the, super, the cycle super highway network, but you can see here the way that's envisioned, um, this is a, um, it's a conceptualization of what uh, a network of cycling routes would look like if it were a highway system or public transit system. So they all lead into London center, city center, and they go to corners of the city. So, um, you know, if you're in London, you know that you're close to route A or, or I'm sorry, route eight or nine or 10. And you know that route 10 takes you um, towards the city center. You know that route 11 connects to route nine. You can just go from route nine to route, from route nine to route 11 back out to the periphery of the city. And that's something that everyone knows. It's something that we don't have in New York, but it's really critical helping the public conceptualize cycling as something that is um, reliable. So I'll, I'll, I'm gonna talk about our own project for a second, Uni. Um, no, it's actually not Unipod, it's Uni. It's something that we've been fighting, you've been fighting this battle for many years. Um, but the idea behind Uni was to create um, cycling infrastructure that provided both parking and service and to incorporate some of the practices that we learned at the Business Improvement District and based on what we see with um, bus shelters and newsstands and looking YC. So, you know, New York City actually has uh, a pretty robust network of on-street furniture um, for what are accepted traditional uses of street space. So newsstands and bus shelters are accepted traditional uses of street space. And so it's pretty standard that we would expect that we would see um, you know, copious amounts of street space allocated to those uses. We've got 3,500 bus shelters and about 400 newsstands. So the question occurred to me in 2016, if we've got 3,500 bus shelters across New York City, we've got 1,700 Lincoln YCs, we've got 750 city bike stations, we've got 400 newsstands, then how come we don't have um, bicycle stations? Surely at least 150 bicycle stations in a public network um, isn't too much to ask for. So what are the challenges that we normally see when we think about bike parking stations? Well, how do they look? What's the design? Who's maintaining them? How are you paying for them? Um, so we set out to kind of solve all of those challenges and to at first pitch it to DOT, to some other actors, and then um, when they didn't go for it, do it ourselves and to show the city that it can work. Um, it was not an easy task. My partner is an architect and we had to think through both um, the, a design kind of perspective, how this would look, how this would operate in the streetscape, but also um, how it would, uh, from a technological perspective, how it would be automated. It has to be automated because economically speaking, there's just no way to really make this facility affordable um, if you're paying someone $15 an hour to, to, to sit down you know, sit down, and open the gate, close the gate. And then of course, you have to close it up at night. Um, our facilities are free to the public. So there was definitely no way to do that. 
<laughs> if it weren't automated. So we had to really think through um, all the tech that would go inside. So everything from video camera monitoring to a door that would close um, automatically. If, if not, then the entire facility's point is moot. Um, having that pod um, be self-leveling so that it could um, actually be built as like a pop-up on the wide variety of surfaces. Most streets in New York are actually pitched. There's basically no flat surface in New York City streets. Um, how it would be illuminated at night so people felt safe going in. Um, we had to allow people to see in, outside in, inside out, because you had to think through, you know, how do you prevent illicit activity? How do you make sure that people, um, for lack of a better word, people aren't going to be murdered inside, as we get asked a lot. Um, how is this thing going to be powered? So do we have solar panels? Do we have, uh, is it going to be plugged into the grid? What's that system going to look like? And what's the access control um, experience going to look like? So what you look, what you have in front of you is um, a pod that looks relatively simple, but there are about 265 different innovation points that we spent about two years um, uh, trying to uh, refine. And um, this is pretty much a prototype. You know, our vision is a lot more holistic and expansive, but it's a, it's a, it's a starting point. Um, the pods are modular, um, so they can be expanded in, in different dimensions. So um, let's say that we've got a double-sided pod um, that could probably hold 40 bikes, but if we could expand it out to hold 60 bikes, um, our smaller one could hold 20 bikes. And the idea is that uh, not, you know, no one public space is, um, is like another a public space. So you may have under the FDR enough space for 150 bikes and in a public plaza in downtown Manhattan, maybe you have enough space for 20 bikes. You're going to need the ability to uh, have different cladding options. Maybe you have different greenery. Maybe you have different types of decor because what's, in, what's appropriate for Times Square may not be appropriate for the Hudson Yards, right? I think property owners here in New York City, rightfully so, are very sensitive about the aesthetic they're trying to produce. And you have to make your, your bike parking infrastructure, if it's been successful and viable, conform um, to the, um, the dynamic of the streetscape. Um, now, when we're thinking through um, the value proposition we offer to not just the city, but to the property owners of the city, um, installation um, became very important. So the idea that this was not permanent infrastructure, it was more of a pop-up piece of infrastructure and it could be installed and set up in 24 hours and also taken down in 24 hours was also pretty key. Uni comes um, in a moving truck, um, and so it gets assembled on site. It's not necessarily akin to a bus shelter in that regard where it's not a unibody piece of infrastructure. It's probably more akin to 150 Lego pieces that, um, that are assembled on, on site. So, you know, the idea of service is, is very important to us. We haven't iterated this out yet, we haven't introduced this um, to the public, but we would like, our vision for the future is um, to have a network of pods in and around um, a city like New York and allow users to lock their bikes um, in locks that, um, that are smart. So you can, they can open and close um, uh, in connection with the overall system. So you wouldn't carry your own lock, you'd lock your bike on one of our smart racks. And you could use your app um, to schedule someone to come repair your bike um, while it's sitting in the pod, while you're at work, while you're at home. Um, and the idea is that we find a relatively streamlined way to integrate both parking and service. Um, and that's important because when you look at um, what the future has to resemble in order to get us to 25 to 40 percent mode share, we really need to find opportunities to increase service capacity. Um, right now, um, our, you know, we're seeing lots of strain um, at 2% mode share, where bike shops can't handle um, the influx of, of customers. And I think it's, it's naive to think we're going to see bike shops um, return the way they were before. As long as, as rental prices stay high, without a subsidy, I think we're locked in. We need to have other means, um, whether it be home delivery, which is relatively expensive, or using on-street um, pods to provide um, bicycle repair services, emergency repairs, uh, and even tune-ups um, to folks who are um, parked inside. Um, and that's really important for us because I think when we look at this from a business perspective, 
um, we see this as one of the most scalable opportunities um, that allows us to make this free um, to the city and also um, free to the user. I will say the pods themselves um, have advertising on the side. Um, they operate in a very similar um, straightforward business proposition that, that bus shelters do, that Lincoln MIC does. You know, our message to the city is, you know, bike infrastructure, until a city bike came along really, has not traditionally been part of this protected class of infrastructure that is um, allowed to tap into streetscape advertising, but it should be. If we are serious about getting bikes to 30% mode share, um, then we have to find an alternate source of financing to pay for the infrastructure. Public transit, you have advertising. Newsstands, you have advertising. Um, city bike, you have advertising. In each of those cases, advertising provides um, a pretty significant share of revenue um, to that underlying service. So for public transit, as high as 6%. Uh, for city bike, as high as 80%. Uh, and for Lincoln YC, for uh, high quality waste receptacles and the big bellies, um, those programs simply wouldn't be possible um, if it weren't for some sort of um, advertising arrangement. And we hope to kind of replicate um, the, um, the same here. So I'm gonna go and, in order and talk about our proof of concepts um, today. Um, I'm gonna go from our most recent to our um, least recent. Um, you're looking at the Barclays Center in downtown Brooklyn. This was um, launched um, almost a year ago, in December of 2019. Um, this is our most advanced station to date. It's the, it's the last of our pilot locations. Um, you know, I think when you look at this picture, um, you know, what I hope comes, you know, is driven home is our commitment to making each of these pods look good and each of these pods, you know, not just be an eyesore on the street. So we actually, you know, we have a rule that 40% at least of the pod is going to be uh, transparent and that allows people to see in outside in and inside out and we know that's important because especially at night you want people to feel comfortable using this so you can see there's a gentleman here fixing his bike um, he's a working cyclist he actually uh, works in the day and then he comes and charges his bike at night and does some repairs but you can see him in there and that's important he can see me outside um, we have the space between the main building and the pod itself um, and the concern that we had initially was this was going to be um, you know, kind of a scary, daunting space for people to traverse, even though a lot of pedestrians were going to, um, were going to really uh, choose this as their primary means of get, walking by the pod. So we very intentionally made this side transparent. You can actually look outside in and inside out during the uh, nighttime, and it, it, it'll, it creates a kind of open environment that's really conducive um, to uh, pedestrian access. And then we installed ancillary lights, I'm sorry, auxiliary lights, excuse me, at the bottom of the pod to illuminate this passageway. Um, and that, again, it drives home our commitment to making these spaces attractive and interesting and nice. Um, this particular pod um, is our most advanced. Um, it is a, a DOB building. We went through the building's process. Um, so it's something that is, um, has been uh, reviewed by architects, is compliant with snow, wind, rain, car impact, and also seismic. Um, we have a direct power connection to the building. So you can see the strip here actually uh, is um, a power conduit that allows us to access power 24 seven to 65. And we did that because we have charging ports both on the inside and outside. So we have USB charging ports for the public to use on the outside, and we have um, charging ports for bikes on the inside. And that wouldn't be possible uh, with solar panels. Um, this was a hit. Um, with the community at launch. Um, we got to date about 300, well now we have about 400 um, signups. Um, and it's a very popular um, amenity for the folks who uh, are, are going to the mall but wanna perhaps visit the mall on a nicer bike. And for working cyclists who uh, use this as a base of operations um, for their work in downtown Brooklyn, Fort Greene, Park Slope. They park their bikes here overnight and take them out during the day. Um, and so it's been, um, it's been really popular um, with the community. And actually the property owner, um, you know, is also deeply enamored with it as well, which is what we uh, seek to do, make everyone happy. Um, we have a partnership, which we're in the process of expanding on with the Port Authority. Um, our, our, our installation with them is a little more than a year old. We provide free bike parking um, to one of the largest 
transportation hubs um, in the system. Um, and, you know, I will say that I think um, the Port Authority folks were skeptical that this could work. I, the feeling was that Journal Square um, was not downtown Manhattan or downtown Brooklyn, and it was, you know, um, a more challenging urban environment. And a large, a large part of our thesis from a design standpoint is that if you care for something and if you design something well, then people will respect it. And, and you can see that at play with these nice glassy bus shelters. Steve, I think remember those old ugly bus shelters we used to have. Um, the thesis was, hey, you know, even in the toughest neighborhood, if you make a nice looking bus shelter, um, people are going to treat it nicely. And we've seen that, um, we've seen that bear out here in Journal Square. I can say to date, we've had no vandalism. It's been over a year. No one has even draw, drawn graffiti on this pod. Um, we've actually, in, in, in about two and a half years of pilot operations, we've only had one incident of graffiti um, total. And so I think that would strike a lot of people as kind of unusual for New York, New Jersey. But again, I think it, it holds true what we know about how streetscapes work and how things are cared for. Um, you know, I think we're, in terms of community engagement, we're probably most proud of this location because um, Journal Square um, folks are very passionate, um, very loyal um, and to, to their community. And there were a lot of questions, you know, in the Port Authority, um, this is on Port Authority property. They just didn't really have to engage folks. So we went out, out and did it for them. Um, you know, we got a lot of questions on Twitter about why it was in the sidewalk, what it was going to be used for. And we took a lot of pride. And we went out and we actually answered those questions. We went to community hearings, we went to people's offices. Um, and at the launch event, there were no less than 25 members of the community who came out um, to cheer the song. And some of our biggest fans um, were initially um, quite skeptical, um, but we were able to explain proactively um, what we were trying to do and why this, um, why this pilot was, was worth giving a shot. We found that, look, even with bike infrastructure, um, one of the things that holds true is that people um, aren't usually opposed to it. What they're opposed to is the process of how it gets built, right? You can't, you know, people want to feel like they're included in the process. They want to feel, um, they want to feel like the process is inclusive and it's something that you're not just telling them what's gonna happen, you're, you're asking them for their input. And when you do it, um, when you engage a community in a proactive manner, um, you often find that people are more than willing to, um, to, to give, give things a shot. So this was our first um, proof of concept. It was in downtown Manhattan. Um, was active for a period of nine months. Um, you know, this was, I think, our, uh, this, was, this was the big experiment. You know, the, the, we were working in partnership with the Alliance for Downtown New York, which is a local bid. And they waited by the phone because they weren't sure if, um, you know, how the community would react. And, you know, the community board eventually called up them up and said, this is, this is probably two, two or three months in, and said, you know, why aren't there more of that? What's the holdup? <laughs> so, you know, here in New York, that's um, when people are complaining they're moving too slow to roll something out, that's usually the ultimate um, sign of praise. Um, and I, I will say that this is when we first realized um, how egalitarian this infrastructure could be. System-wide in all three of our deployments, 65% um, of our users are non-white, 50% um, of our users are below area median income. Um, that's important because when you look at um, bike share systems, um, Lime releases their stats for bike share and for scooter share 17% of their user base are, are Black and Latinx, even though they operate in communities like DC and LA and, uh, and, um, and Austin that are um, overwhelmingly uh, Black and Brown. Uh, in the capital bike share system in Washington, DC, 5% um, are Black, and uh, of the users are Black, excuse me, even though the city itself is 50% Black. So when we think about rolling up this kind of infrastructure, and making it available to everyone. Um, what this has to be from a policy perspective is, if you design it right and you, you set it at a price point that is interesting and attractive, 
you're going to see what is really a reflection of what Bike NYC actually looks like. Um, and that's something that we've been very excited about. And it's been true to who we are ever since. Um, you know, when we started the journey, um, we were operating in mostly obs obscurity. So at Atlantic Terminal, it was really the ultimate sign of, um, of triumph that um, politicians showed up to cut the ribbon, right? And, you know, it, it really validates our perspective that, um, that if you design something and operate something competently, if you make it accessible to everyone, if you uh, are really thoughtful in how you integrate features, um, you know, and you listen to the community, then infrastructure can work and it can scale and it can metastasize in a manner that makes everyone happy. Um, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of with Uni is that everyone's happy, it seems, right? Everyone seems to generally like it and able to cultivate um, a reputation for really working with all sides to create something that um, isn't just tolerated, but embraced. Um, now, I don't wanna talk about you know, UNI exclusively. Um, I wanna talk about some policy ideas for how we get cycling uh, to 25 and 30% mode share, given what we've just discussed. Um, so, you know, going, going from the network on down, we need a full integration with mass transit. Um, one of the challenges we have here in New York is that we have a pretty fractured local economy when it comes to transportation planning. So we've got the Port Authority with TAF, MJ Transit on the, on the Jersey side. We've got the MTA, which of course is state run. We've got the DOT, which is city run. Um, but what we really need is a plan for how we're going to transition um, mass transit riders to bikes and vice versa, because often they are, are the same. So that means um, secure bike parking at subway stations. It means having um, bus, uh, bike racks on bus shelters. It means um, having a plan for how people can carry their bikes into the subway. Um, it means allowing people who um, are on bikes perhaps to understand, you know, on, on, on cycling routes where transportation um, bus stops and, and, tra and, and subway stops are, right? Having those demarcated. And it means we create a cycling system in New York City that's actually a network of interconnected routes, having that marketed or demarcated on um, a subway map. So you can see where the high quality uh, cycling facilities are. So there can be a, um, um, a feeling of, of integration, um, which, is, which is so key. Um, when we think about what a connected network of tiered cycling routes actually means, it means, you know, when you look at cars, you have highways, arterials, and avenues. And so we need to think about um, bikes in the same manner. You know, in driving a car, you, you wouldn't, like, imagine driving a car on a highway and then suddenly it just turns into an avenue. That, that wouldn't really make a lot of sense because what we have in New York City where you're, you're biking down, you know, I think on the Brooklyn side of the Manhattan Bridge, I've been fascinated by this for many years. You're biking over the Manhattan Bridge. Not so bad, kind of narrow, but kind of okay. Then you kind of get onto the street. You, you get down to... Um, to Navy Street, and you turn on to Flushing, and you're caught in this kind of like weird mixing zone, which kind of seems like a maelstrom, a no man's land. Um, you're, you're kind of coming off what is a mini bike highway, and you're going on to this kind of high, you know, car highway, you know, in a, in a real, <laughs> it, 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 I, I, it's absurd. In, in a real um, convenient cycling economy, that wouldn't happen. You would have safe ways and convenient ways for people to get from point A to point B on the route. And we would have, you know, premium highways that are, have special design components. Think about lighting, trees, special bike signs for, um, for to stop and to go. Um, that would directly connect to what we would call arterials and avenues that are secondary and tertiary um, uh, sort of connecting branches that would allow people to continue on their journeys. Um, right now, what we have is basically a haphazard soup that uh, is built for people who are kind of tinkering around on a bicycle, not serious journeys. Um, you know, thinking about parking and storage, a citywide bike parking system. Um, you know, we are so far away from what London and Paris um, and even LA are doing, but a public bike parking system where we think about, you know, not one or two or 15, but thousands of bike parking spaces that are dispersed across the city that are priced affordable 
for the public to use, that is a complement to in-building um, parking facilities that are private. So um, the easiest way to do that would be to have the DOT issue an RFP um, like they do for um, bike shelter, I'm sorry, bus shelters and newsstands um, for bike parking. Um, a, a citywide franchise, uh, which could be financed through advertising, the same that Lincoln YC is, um, would be revenue neutral um, at worst, revenue positive at best, and would be relatively affordable for the public, if not free. Um, more stringent requirements for workplaces and residences. So um, in 2009, the city, um, city planning spearheaded what we call bikes and buildings. And Bikes and Buildings is um, a package of, um, of zoning incentives um, that basically, or zoning requirements, I should say, that basically compel um, workplaces, uh, new residences, and parking garages uh, and parking lots to have, um, have bike parking. And it's largely ineffective. Here's why. Because the city, you can't compel people to do many things in New York, especially if they're big businesses. They almost always find a way around it usually you have to package in incentives or you have to explain to them why it's in their interest to do it. So in the case of workplaces, um, workplaces in New York are required to have a bike plan. And if they don't, then they can be tattled, um, they can be tattled on, excuse me, by uh, an employee. So there goes your, your pain point number one. Um, employees are, usually don't have the time um, or the patience to um, file a complaint with the Department of Transportation um, you know, about their workplace. They're most often gonna either choose to park their bike outside or just leave their bike at home. So we have to take that away and we have to ensure that the DOT has some sort of mechanism to, in, you know, to inspect or to, um, to, to quality assure their process that doesn't require uh, a third party worker. Um, but also look, even the workplaces that do provide secure bike parking often make it so Byzantine and laborious that you might as well not provide it at all. So one story that um, comes from one of our uni partners is a relatively high net worth individual. He has his own office in the building and they say, look, you gotta park it downstairs in the basement, right? You have to come in through the cargo, the cargo elevator. And if your bike is downstairs after 4 p.m. and the car elevator shuts down, the freight shuts down, then we throw your bike away. So, you know, the, the, the not so subtle message is yes, we check the box, but it's so inconvenient that you might as well not do it. Um, and so in order for us to get to a place where um, workplaces and residences have convenient secure bike parking, we have to have some, some really strong requirements that dictate not just um, not just the quantity, but the quality. And we also have to have perhaps some tax inducements uh, to reward people who create grade A tier one bike parking facilities. Um, garages are a different story. I think, you know, look, I think people often look at garages and say, well, you know, we have garages and parking cars. Why can't they park bikes? The garages hate it. So when they, um, when they were offered when they were required to provide bike parking, they did, um, but they raised the price accordingly. So you can go to Midtown and see a garage that says $500 uh, for the month. And that's because the garages usually don't want their attendants parking bikes and they don't want people walking around their garage with bikes. And the cyclists hate it too. You know, cyclists really hate the idea of navigating this really um, you know, maze, underground maze of dark, um, you know, parking garages, but but the thieves love it because if a thief can go into a parking garage, sneak in, and clip a bike relatively easily, and it's actually much more private than on the street. Um, so, if you want garages to do it right, you're, you're going to have to get them to provide um, good, secure bike parking facilities closer to the entrance, and that's going to require tax inducements as well. It's going to require the city to explain to these garages why they should take their time. Um, to provide the service. Um, I think tax incentives for vacant properties to provide bike parking is also a smart idea. So uh, I get asked a lot about vacant storefronts. Why can't we use vacant storefronts? Well, um, the truth of the, but the matter is about vacant storefronts is if you, go to a, um, if you go to a storefront and say, hey, I, wanna, I want to rent your property, um, they may give you a lease for a year, 
um, but they're not going to give you a lease for five years. And if they're going to, if you're being asked to invest uh, a lot to optimize the space for bike parking, the brand attendant and the staff member, um, it's just not going to pencil out in a year. Um, there's a there's a service called Bike Drop in London, which uses um, the storefront retail model. They provide bike parking. Um, it's uh, six pounds a day. It's twelve hundred pounds a year to park your bike. Uh, I, I and again, that's in pounds. So it's probably about you know thirty five percent more in dollars. Don't think that's viable um, or ethical here in New York City. Um, we need a you need know, a way to produce this this, this amenity this utility, I should say, that is um, more cost more cost effective and more egalitarian. And then lastly, with service, city constructed kiosks, right? So what the city can do, um, what the city has done in other industries and verticals, when you go to when you go to parks, you see kiosks that provide coffee, um, provide um, food. You know, Shake Shack was famously in a New York City basically concession kiosk. Um, I don't see why we can't be building kiosks like those along major cycling routes even today. So when you look at the greenways, for example, why can't the city of New York build a medium-sized kiosk, rent that kiosk to a local bike shop and say, look, if you're going to have the citywide contract uh, for five or six kiosks, then you need to be open during these hours, charge these prices, provide these services. It would be a win for the bike shop because they would be able to uh, rent um, retail space at a far lower price than they could um, you know, on the street. It'd be a win for cyclists who would have a network of um, citywide service centers that would um, have standardized hours, standardized services, standardized pricing. Um, and it would be a win for the city because you're finding a way to increase mode share, which is ostensibly the goal, and you're activating on new spaces. Um, and then lastly, when we think about our plan, how we're going to get to this 25, 30% mode share, um, we really need to kind of start from scratch. Um, I think right now, you know, New York City had a great master plan for bikes in 2007. Um, it's 2020. Uh, the city has changed a lot. So we have to start with, um, like, any, like any business or political campaign starts, you've got to start with polls and focus groups. We have to talk to New Yorkers, both New Yorkers that ride, uh, and New Yorkers that don't ride. And in between those, New Yorkers who ride but want to ride more. And understand from every race and creed, and creed and class um, how folks um, how folks are relating to this ecosystem and what we can do to provide them um, with more access and a system and experience that is more rewarding. Use that feedback to generate the next master plan. Um, and so that's my presentation. Um, I look forward to questions and comments and to the discussion ahead. All right, thanks, Shabazz. And maybe if you, if you um, let's see, stop sharing. Okay. Um, there are a couple questions that were posed in the chat. I'm, I'm going to take one of them and, and just kind of um, weave it into something that, that your great presentation um, stimulated a thought that simulated in me was just, you know, the bike boom. There's, and that was your first slide. Um, it's going on amidst this incredible economic dislocation due to the pandemic, which create all of these opportunities. I mean, we see businesses closing around us. Um, so many businesses that were part of the fabric of our daily lives are closing, can't make it. We try to support them. Um, and, you know, Judd, Judd had said, it's so hard to find a bike. Like, it's so hard to find bikes, even that there's such a demand for them. What's your take on why the city would not look at this as an opportunity during this economic dislocation to say, hey, people are opting for bikes, for transportation, for all the reasons we know that you've talked about. Yeah. And we're gonna, we're gonna facilitate that and support that the way, you know, we always think of cities as being, trying to stimulate local economic activity, not just because they wanna make the goods and services of that 
activity available, but because it, it obviously generates tax revenue for the city, it generates vitality, it generates interest. Um, why would the current administration, why aren't they, you know, why aren't they listening when they say we need another, where are the rest of the Unipods for downtown Manhattan? <laughs> Um, so I'm reading a book now called Subway, and it's, a, it's about, you know, you probably guessed the history of the subway in New York City. And it is amazing to me when we talk about the lack of, of transportation services that, um, you know, are, are, are capital products that we've seen in New York, um, how much got done with way less so long ago. So, you know, back in the day, back in 1904, 1900, um, all the challenges we face today were there, but 10 times greater, right? Technology wasn't nearly as advanced. Um, the, there was much more corruption. Um, there was uh, much, there was just as much nimbyism as there is today, if not more. Um, the, the corporate interests were as, were as protracted, but we found a way to get it done. Um, you know, I think looking at cycling um, here in New York, there are two problems. Foremost, we, don't have an attitude that lends itself well to any transportation development in New York City, right? You can, you can just look at cycling, look at um, the subway, look at, you know, um, you know, busways, for example. We have, you know, we built 14th Street, so quote unquote built, we, we pat ourselves on the back when we talk about building uh, a four block long busway down J Street uh, in Brooklyn. Right, and the, you know, the MTA asked for 60 uh, miles of busway, we do maybe five miles of busway. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a systemic problem. I think bikes are a part of that, where we don't really, um, we haven't acclimated ourselves in the generation to do big, bold, visionary things. It is a problem um, with this administration for sure. Um, it's not solely limited to this administration. Um, in cities across the country, we're seeing and institutional reticence to moving swiftly and boldly. Um, I think the next administration you know, has an opportunity to think holistically about bikes, pedestrianism, um, and, and transit in a way that um, you know, no administration uh, that I can remember has had or anywhere in the country has had. Look, I think, I think even in today's environment, great things are possible. In, in LA, you know, it was illegal to build a subway until um, 2005, right? It was literally against the law, right? That's how, that's, how, that's how entrenched the opposition was to doing projects there. Now LA is leading the charge in building new subways and new transportation projects. So here in New York, you know, look what's happening in Paris and what's happening in London and the surge in popularity that we're seeing on bikes and the surge in popularity that we're seeing with open streets. I think there's a political moment where um, people actually are open and interested in bike infrastructure. I just think we have to find, um, you know, a, an administration that's willing to seize that moment and then empower them. Uh, a lot of this is on them, but it's also on the city council. It's also on um, the media, the fourth estate. You know, give them the impetus to, to think big, to think systemically, do big things. Right now, we've lacked that. And, and, and some of it, you know, to be clear, is also just the fact that we have a mayor who doesn't seem to be interested in doing anything, um, any big things. You know, we spent $600 million in ferries. I can make you a long list of things that we could have done with $600 million that would have probably been, you know, more effective, but it became clear at that moment that um, we weren't looking to think big in New York City. We're looking to think, um, you know, little, yep. Ouch, okay, I can't disagree. Um, Another question that was posed by Judd, um, and then there was one in the Q&A, but, um, you know, the issue of whether, you know, City Bike, rather City Bank sponsors a service like City Bike as a straight up business proposition and it's worth every penny they pay, or is this some sort of a philanthropic endeavor by City Bank? And, um, you know, for full disclosure, I used to represent City Bike, um, not for a few years now since their Lyft acquisition. But um, 
you know, my impression was always that it was a huge win for Citibank. It was a very smart investment. Um, the branding of their bikes, which are everywhere, they're called city bikes. They'll always be called city bikes, probably, no matter who the sponsor is. <laughs> um, was just a really smart marketing decision and a good ad buy. But um, I'm, you know, I and, and Judd both are wondering if you agree. I think, look, when you talk to the people at, at City, it's, it's one of the most valuable advertising assets. Um, you know, it started out um, as many sponsorships do as a favor to the city. Um, it was, um, you know, the city, Jeanette Teddy Khan is, is not shy about sharing that the city basically called up, you know, city, the city called up city and said, um, hey, you know, we're doing this thing. Can you, you know, can you help us out? And it was a little risky at the time because, you know, folks weren't sure if um, how this thing would turn out. The New York Daily News and the Post were, you know, talking about carnage in the streets. And so people were like, oh, I don't know, right? You know, and, and they, they stepped up and did it. And um, two things became clear right away. Foremost, um, we learned that it was, um, it was extremely popular and that um, it was, um, it was something that, oh, one second, um, it was a, a marketing coup for, for city, by, for, for city, um, and that they, that, that, that they, um, didn't pay anything for it. In fact, um, Alta basically went bankrupt because city didn't pay enough. Um, it was considered the marketing steal of a century. Um, you know, when you talk to the guys at city, you know, and you get, you know, get some drinks in them. They'll tell you that when you look across their portfolio of assets, they've got City Field, you know, they've got, um, you know, City Bike, they've got a few other um, branding assets that they kind of sponsor. City Bike is their crown jewel. You know, it's, it's, it's the, by far the most um, valuable thing they have, and not just because of the sponsorship, it's also because they have the advertising panels on the assets themselves. People often forget that those signs include straight up um, city, city advertisements. Um, that are like talking about, you know, 5% cash back or whatever. So um, it's really something that's- Free, quite free toaster. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So they love it. Um, it's, look, I mean, look, do I think that it's, um, do I think maybe, I think, do I think it started as a charitable proposition? Sure, I think, I think, I think that it was a real risk that um, City took to step forward and to do this that required them to kind of double bottom line it. Um, I think now it was a little bit of a different kind of proposition. I think they're really um, excited about it. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think that's, 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 that's largely right. I think we, cities should understand that sponsorship and, and some advertising can um, get brands excited. And it makes a lot of sense um, to, 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 market, to market those away. I think that's what's happened here. Mm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you've said. Um, and you said something else that really struck me. I thought it was a very kind of um, a good point that we don't hear often enough. And I, I'm not sure I've heard articulated as well before the idea that good design inspires public respect and stewardship of public infrastructure, good design, good maintenance. And, um, you know, of course that's true. And we all, we all know and believe that's true because that's how we feel. And at the same time, there's this meme out there of um, a well-designed, novelly designed urban infrastructure is about gentrification. You know, when you start seeing the city bike stand in your neighborhood, that's not for you. That's for the people they're gonna move you out to make way for. Um, and, you know, do you hear that? Do you hear that bike infrastructure for, for, for the sake of argument, even Unipod is just like the leading wage, wave of gentrification. Yeah, you, you know, know what? Um, yeah, know so, you, so. You already talked about like the, the demographic participation yes. that you've done. So, I mean, it's just, the answer's there. So, but anyway. look, uh, they're, they're, uh, you know, in any kind of, the answer is yes. People occasionally say, I, one person called, um, one person who's now a friend and we were able to have a, a, a nice conversation with her um, was a, you know, called it a gentrification box. Um, and, uh, you know, another person, you know, who I think was just on Twitter and was trolling and said, oh, you know, you're taking money away from 
kids in public school. It, you know, and it wasn't. But but look, when you when you when you help people understand um, a few things, um, they ninety nine point nine nine percent of the companies that I've been in, um, people now people understand why that is a bankrupt um, train of thought. Um, first. Um, it's free. It's open to everybody. It's free to use. You know, we're not charging, um, you know, city bike like prices. We're not charging private garage prices. Um, it's um, it's relatively um, egalitarian from that perspective. And I think the results bear those out. Um, when you look at um, why our user base is as diverse as it is, then um, it's something that um, I think becomes relatively clear. I'm gonna share in the chat right now, actually. Um, we, um, I don't know if you saw this, uh, Steve, but we, um, we, just give me one second. Um, we recently filmed um, a series called Uni Perspectives. Um, and, um, you know, it features, um, you know, members of the community, a lot of whom are our members well, actually, not just members of the community, um, talking about how they want more. And one of the one of the one of the perspectives that got the most um, the most amount of feedback was Kwan's. Um, and um, Kwan, I'll just share with his story. Kwan uh, lives in a shelter in, in in Manhattan, in Chinatown. He um, commutes from Chinatown to Atlantic Terminal to Pod every morning because he needs his bike to make deliveries for Grubhub and he can't keep his bike in the shelter. And for him, um, it being free allows him to save up more money to move up the shelter. Um, for him, um, you know, it's so important that he's willing to take the subway every day, six or seven stops down to downtown Brooklyn just for that. So, you know, I think when people say, oh, this is a gentrification tool, um, it doesn't comport with reality. You, 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 you know, you say, look, there are 50,000 mostly black, brown, and Asian um, and, um, folks who are delivering for restaurants that rely on uh, unsafe bike lanes and bike parking um, and bike infrastructure. What about them? You know, when you go to black communities, now you see black kids, you know, do freelancing for um, Postmates, you know, what about them? When you say, hey, you know, this is this this person, all they've got is a bike uh, to get around. Uh, what about them, right? Um, it, it, it's really, it's really, it, it's almost sometimes angering when I hear that because it's like you're erasing all of those people that exist. There's, it's, it's quite possible here in New York that a majority of cyclists are black and brown, uh, or black, brown, and Asian, I should say. Um, and for people to insinuate that. Um, because we have safe infrastructure for bikes, that's gentrification, um, is, is, is incomprehensible. I will say that um, what is gentrification infrastructure typically um, are parking garages. Um, what is gentrification infrastructure um, are, um, are driving lanes, um, you know, are, are, are car facilities. Because, you know, we know in New York City, if you commute to work via vehicle, um, you tend to make a lot more than folks who commute by bike and folks who commute by public transportation. The average person, I believe, who commutes to Manhattan in a car is making like $85,000 a year. Um, so, you know, it, that's what we should be t looking at and saying, okay, if you really want to make an egalitarian society, let's think holistically about how we can recalibrate our on-street space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. And since there's just a minute left in our presentation, I do have to ask you, does the use of transparent materials, which I agree with you, has so many pluses associated with the Unipod construction, but does it create, does it make it easier to break into an Unipod? Have you ever had break-ins or are they secure? Yeah, yeah. I, um, because you've never had a break-in. Um, we've had one bike, so, so we've had one bike stolen, we've had um, no break-ins. I can tell you that a bit about how this happened in a second. And we do provide insurance to the bikes inside. Um, so if, 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 if your bike does get stolen, we cover the depreciated value of the bike. 
Um, so um, I tell people off the bat, we're not Fort Knox. Um, we don't want to be Fort Knox. We want to be something that's relatively secure. Like if you take your bike and put it in a boonie, it's 99.9% .9 less likely to be stolen than living on the street, right? Now, that doesn't mean that it's never going to be stolen. It just means it's, it's probably not going to be stolen. Um, you know, you have to think about, um, so people know their bikes in there already. They can see it, they know their bikes in there. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that it, um, that, that having to be transparent is a negative thing. I think it's a positive thing because if someone is going to perform an illicit activity like stealing a bike, they know they're going to be seen, right? We have this, this impression, think about garages, for example, that it, because it's, it's hidden away, it's safer. That's actually often not true. Uh, when it comes to bike theft, you know, when you, when you talk it to bike New York people, in general, <laughs> yeah, they'll say like, "Look, I prefer to side street to steal bikes because I can steal a bike. I don't want to steal a bike on Broadway. I'll steal a bike on, uh, you know, on like First Street, like in the corner." All right. So having it be out in the open and very visible um, makes everyone safer. Um, we did, have, you know, the biggest point of security risk is in the sign up process. So we have to make sure that people aren't signing up to come in. And steal bikes, right? Um, so we we did have that happen once. Um, that was in the summer. We had um, someone who signed up, and they, they actually raised um, some red flags at the get go. And we did get in contact with them. We did ask them for an ID to verify their identity. They they, they shared their ID. Um, it was a fake ID. Um, and um, they, the next day they came in and stole a bike, and it was not an uni kind of day because it was a sixty five hundred dollar bike. Um, but they came in, we have them on camera, and we're like, that's not a 27-year-old Jamaican guy. That guy is not, yeah, that's a white guy, right? And we realized right away that what had happened. Um, and, you know, look, it was a tough conversation um, with Bahati. He was the, the user that had his bike stolen. He's still a user. Um, we did give him a check for 2,500 um, bucks. You know, obviously less than his new track cost, but, um, but also much more than he would have gotten on the street. Um, we did follow police support with him. We spent the afternoon with him on the phone. And I think this is the exception that proves the rule. Um, when we talk about biking in New York City, it's like the wild west for lots of people, right? Where you are on your own. And even if I can't give you back your bike, even if I can't, you know, catch the guy who did it, I can hold your hand and, and help you feel like you're not tackling this space alone. And that's what we do, by the way, in every other transportation mode. If you, you know, um, if your purse drops in the subway track, there's someone to call, right? If your train gets stuck, there's someone to call. If your car crashes, there's someone to call, right? If, if you know, when you, when you have your bike stolen, there's usually no one to call, right? When you've got a flat, there's no one to call. So you know, even that tough circumstance, talking to someone, saying, hey, you know, here's the video, so they can actually see it happen saying, hey, look, you know, we'll fire a police report with you. We've launched an investigation. This is what happened. We're so sorry. We find even that, you know, has um, a lot of efficacy. And, and, and users do really understand that their bike is gone. We'd be very happy knowing that they're part of a system that is um, competent and helps protect their, um, their property. That's, you know, that's great. And that's something that I think can help. I mean, a lot of the reasons you see the carcasses, the frames of bikes left around with all the components ripped off is when people come out and they want to get back on their bike and they see that it's unrideable because the wheels or the seat or whatever else was taken, um, they just leave it there. And then right. it, it turns into a blight. It turns into a lost parking space for other people who have functional bikes. It, it, you know, it's just, uh, as you say, it's the, the symbol of a broken heart or broken dreams of what, what urban transportation could be. Um, and, you know, thanks for coming and sketching out what, what that dream could look like if we did it right, if we look to other peer world cities. Um, you know, I just can't believe how badly we're muffing it, but... Um, <laughs> I'm glad to know that I'm glad to know that there are people taking, you know, a smart, um, incisive, um, design-informed perspective on these economic needs and helping us think about 
the importance of utility cycling in the city since the pandemic, um, since before the pandemic, um, as a complement to all the other different types of cycling. Um, your economic perspective on who is actually cycling and, um, you know, you know, just thinking about it by the raw numbers instead of tribally, the way many cyclists do. I'm a commuter or I, I'm a pedal cyclist. I don't like e-bikes. I don't like scooters. Wow. I'm a road cyclist. I don't commute because, you know, the bike lanes are death traps, whatever it is. I mean, you're just, you're just, um, it's very refreshing and helpful to hear you lay out exactly what is, is going on. And it, it helps give a fresh perspective. So, um, Thank you so much, and thank you. uh, I'm seeing you around. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Uh, feel free to email me. I'll leave my email address in the thread if anyone wants to shoot me okay. an email. In fact, why don't you why don't you just say your email as well and uh, and your okay. Twitter handle for those on Twitter. I am my email address is at uh, unipod o o n p p o d dot com. Uh, my Twitter is just Shabazz Stewart. I'll put my Twitter handle. In the uh, and that's also the same for Instagram and, and for there it Facebook. Is. It's in the chat. So thanks a lot, Shabazz. And as I say, I'll see you around. Thanks for taking the time. See you around. Thank Great. you so much, Steve. All right. Thanks. All right.